Alright everyone, welcome back to Royville. We just got done watching Star Trek Picard. Episode 3, The End is the Beginning. Whatever that means. Anyway, so we're going to discuss it, Ellen and I, and then at the end of our discussion, we're going to give this episode our warp rating between 1 and 10. Okay, so, Ellen... What were your initial thoughts after watching the episode? I was trying to figure out how or why the character of Rafi was mad at Picard. Instead, well, she was mad at everyone, but she was specifically mad at Picard because that's how they opened the whole the whole episode. So, yeah, this episode had a lot of new characters. Yeah, we saw Ralphie, Raffy, Raffy, Raffy at the end of the previous episode, but they really kind of got into her background in this episode. We also are introduced to the pilot, the ship that will be taking Picard on his adventure as well, and a couple E M H E N H characters. That and all look like him. That that all look like him. Yes, yes. The the pilot. That all look like the pilot. So maybe he did some jury rigging or you can get just get an EMH that looks like you now at the corner store. So yeah. So I my initial impressions of this episode were I hate to say it. I really liked some of the character introductions but I thought it was kind of slow there was a lot of exposition I, really there was uh, the only true like there were a couple of exciting moments for me um, one of them happens on the board cube and one of them happened at the end there um, we'll get to it in due time both of them but uh, there was a lot of exposition because they were introducing three new characters in all actuality. One was kind of an older character being re- re- reintroduced, but he was only in two episodes of TNG. Ah, okay. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. We'll get to him. But um, the other two are brand new. And we needed at least a slight background or connection story. There were some exciting scenes, but it was mostly talking and Picard trying to make things better with Rafi, who evidently got fired because Picard stepped down because he was pushing for the Romulan uh, evacuation. Yeah, I guess guess from what you kind of gather in the first opening uh, scenes of this episode is that Rafi is, or was, Picard's right-hand person. She was with him when he wanted to create a fleet to help evacuate Romulus before the supernova, which leads to the Calvin or Kelvin universe. And because he basically gave an ultimatum, either you side with me and give me what I want, or I'm going to resign from Starfleet. And Starfleet said... See ya, don't let the door hit you on the way out. And Rafi was part of that fallout, basically. And because of that, she didn't have a good life after that and regretted uh, being with Picard in that moment, I think, and has taken that regret and kind of turned that into very negative feelings towards Picard, who she calls JL. Yeah, that was, that was oh, cute. That was, it was <laughs> cute, but also at some times it kind of seemed we need to have her give him a nickname. Because so, he's not the captain. Right, but it seems like, well, she called him and JL while he was an admiral. Okay, that's true. The impression that I got from her job, because I don't know what all the acronyms mean, uh, when Picard came back and said, if you don't, basically, I guess there was a meeting where he said, if you don't 
allow us to do the, right, the yeah. scaled back evacuation, I'm going to resign. Yeah, that's what. Mm-hmm. And then <clears throat> they accepted his resignation, and then pretty much as they were speaking about it, she got called into a meeting with the CD. CC. CNC. Okay. What is that? I'm assuming it's commander in chief, but I All don't right. know exactly. Okay. So, but her job from what I am getting from what her talents were shown was in intelligence. So, what well, I think the reason they were working together on the Romulan evacuation was that Romulus at the time of the supernova was still an enemy of the Federation. So they didn't know how to approach them with the help. So, the intelligence officer was gathering, you know, intelligence. And she saw, they alluded to her seeing a conspiracy or a cover-up in the whole process of the whole thing. And so, I think part of the reason she was fired is that the CNC actually saw that there was a possibility that she might have been on to them in some small manner. The bad guys. Yeah. Yeah, there's... In the first two reviews, we kind of wanted to hold a few items in reserve because they were big reveals. I didn't really think this episode had any. Any kind of earth-shattering reveals that, oh no, if, if you know that, it's going to kind of ruin something big for you. And I don't really think this one had that. No, there was the, oh, that's very, very awesome moment on the board cube with Hugh. yes yes uh hugh does return in this episode he is helping and i think in charge of various operations on the cube uh with what we were discussing in the second episode about taking the items off of the borg and selling them at the corner store um I think they're taking the, the the cybernetics from the Borg drones in order to possibly save the biological life. Yeah, I, I think that as well. But I, because of all of the dealings where they kind of show that it might be shady, I kind of think that there's also an ulterior motive that we're not being told yet. It is the Romulans. That's true. It is the Romulans and... Putting secret before police in the Romulan society is redundant because everything is secret. Yeah. And uh, once again, and we're kind of jumping around. Basically, there's some opening scenes with Rafi. You get her interaction with Picard. Then it jumps to Picard meeting the pilot. and Rios. Rios. And there are some scenes on the Borg cube with the with twin, Soji. with Soji and the twin, and Narek is the and Narek Romulan. The, the Romulan who is, as you know, if you watch the second episode, a bad guy and creepy. And Ellen says creepy. Also, he might be the bad guy that turns to good. They're kind of making Maybe. it so that he might like her enough that he's going to have to question his values. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Um, and there's an attack on Picard by that Romulan faction that is the worst special forces Romulan group ever because every time they show up they get their butts kicked. Well, they have the acid blood. That doesn't mean they don't get their butt kicks every I'm time. I'm just saying, that's that's what makes them super secret. <laughs> right. And then you get that there is a group of Romulans that were turned into Borg. But for some reason, Borg and Romulan physiology doesn't mix and they go crazy. Well, there is that, but there was all, always that danger with any biological life form being right, brought back but they from said, the board. Right, but they said specifically that all of the Romulans are like that, and none of the other species 
are. But they also alluded to an event on the ship that they assimilated that may have caused all that, too. Well, true. And that was part of this growing mystery that was happening. (coughs) But as of now, we don't know much beyond that, though. What we do know is that the Romulans go crazy. Okay, that's fair. The other thing that we do know as of this episode is that, as in the first episode... Dodge gets her awakening, her her inner program gets activated in a physical manner, whereas Soji's programming is awakened in the conversation that she has with one of the Romulans in a more intellectual manner. She was able to spout off facts that she... Supposedly didn't know. She swears she never heard of the name of the Romulan ship that she brought up and the situation that she was uh, referring to. She swears up and down she'd never heard it before. Uh, So at this point, Dodge, um, in Dodge's short character arc, this is the point where that super secret Romulan cell started hunting her down was when her programming started to awaken. So, Narek being super secret Romulan spy on the Romulan Borg cube, may be the, serving the same purpose as that cell of people who killed Dodge. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I think, though, the Romulan agents... On the Borg cube that are after her, though, because his sister or some, I think it's his sister. Um, the she keeps calling him brother. Right. So I think that they're actually though trying to get her in some way on their side. They don't just want to kill her. They want what she knows. Right. After that, she's expendable. So maybe then the Romulan hit team had to kill the one that was just the fighter. And they want the one that's intellectual. They want the knowledge that one has. But Dodge was more than just physical. Well, right. But they didn't try to capture her at all. They just killed her. But Narek, if you remember, in this particular episode, actually tells the the Romulan agent who was in charge of that operation that it was a miscalculation on her ah, part. You, okay. That, that was what they were referring to. Okay. I did not... I missed that in the episode. So... That's why I'm like... I, I don't know what's going... Why they're treating Soji differently than what they treated Dodge. Except for the fact that it was a miscalculation. Whatever that meant. Right, right. Okay, so I think the, that being said, I think the big thing of this episode were introductions and kind of the group, Picard's group getting together. The last piece of that puzzle really is Dr. Agnes Jurati, who we've already seen. She's the doctor who he talked to at the Daystrom Institute. Yes, she decided that she really needed to go with Picard, and she kind of showed up in the scene where Picard was getting attacked and accidentally, on purpose, killed the Romulan that she was really upset about killing because she's not a fighter. Yeah, she's a little, she's pretty stereotypical at at this point. Of the the sort of flighty, not flighty, that's not the right word, the, the, the wound too tight scientist. Yeah, I mean, at this point, there's a lot of kind of stereotype I see in Picard's people. There's the woman from Picard's past that is, no matter what you say or do, I'm going to hate you for it until... Probably episodes down the line, she doesn't anymore. There's the kind of flighty, mousy, 
scientist who will discover her own and become a strong woman. And there's the devil may care pilot with a troubled past with a troubled past so yeah i mean it's it's classic story classic stereotypes but i i kind of think it worked a little bit uh in this one i do like maybe i'm a sucker for the stereotype but i do like the pilot he's ex starfleet Something bad happened, but he's still an awesome pilot, and he, you know, plays by his own rules. He smokes stogies in the 23rd century. Oh, does he? Yeah, he was smoking his okay, cigar the right. entire time. Well, <laughs> and, and, uh... Rafi. Rafi, I'm sorry, I'm never going to get her name right. Rafi was doing was vaping and i'm like in the 24th century like anyway okay i thought that was odd but so yeah so we smoke now in star trek everybody just so you know we're Uh, big smokers ruffy ruffy did hook picard up with the pilot though so there was a little chink in her armor as far as at least helping him do what he needed to do. And Picard knew how to play her a little bit because he sent her some information to investigate. Mm-hmm. And she couldn't, you know, leave that riddle alone. And she found out where she thought Maddox was. Bruce Maddox, who, as you know, Picard is looking for. And so now they're going to go to a place called Free Cloud, which... A lot of people seem to know about, Picard knows about it, the other characters know about it. We don't. Well, we don't, and the scientist doesn't. So. I don't know if she doesn't so much as she asked. She, she, she had no idea what it was. Well, she asked what it was. No, she said, why do you want to go to Free Cloud? Oh, okay. Why do you want to go to Man, Free Cloud? Man, I should watch the show, I guess, again. <laughs> well, no, be, because the answer was, I don't have... The answer was, is this what we're doing now? Are we going to just... Basically, it, it, it makes more sense that she was asking why she, why Rafi wanted to go to Free Cloud as opposed to what is Free Cloud. Okay. The rest of the conversation just makes... Okay. So, I mean, honestly, that being said... Um... We need to back up just a little bit because we did bring him up before. Hugh is the person in charge of the reclamation project. Right. Hugh is a former Borg drone that was aboard the Enterprise in The Next Generation. Yeah, he was in a couple episodes of The Next Generation. The Next Generation, um, he had been in a crash with a couple other Borg drones. He was the only one that survived. Picard and the crew of the Enterprise took him aboard and basically implanted or helped to use him, were going to use him to implant a virus in the Borg. Cooler heads prevailed and they just basically sent him back to the Borg. With the, with an individual identity at that point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, And since it's a collective mind who knows what happened at that point. However, at this point, 27 years later, he was a reclaimed drone. He is not a Borg drone. He has very little of the synthetic cybernetic enhancements, uh, much like Seven of Nine in Voyager, which is the same thing that's happening with the reclaimed Romulans on the Borg cube. They still have some of their cybernetics, just like Seven of Nine, the facial implants and the like, because uh, I guess 27 years in the future, they still can't free their neural nets from... Right. Even though they have Seven of Nine to study, as well as evidently an entire Borg cube. Well, I guess the Romulans do. So anyway, I wanted to back up and clarify who Hugh is, because we did jump around a little bit. Um, but aside from that, Picard, one, uh, there's a, a nice scene between him and Lyris, who is his 
the, the female of the couple, the Romulan couple who's staying with him. Uh, there's a nice little scene on his... And they were badasses in the fight. Yes, they were. So They're only Tal Shiar. Yeah, yeah, and they're only Tal Shiar, so they were kicking butt and taking names. They were. And actually, Picard was a pretty good shot, but I think he broke his hips. So. Yeah, I was going to say, um, usually in scenes like that, if somebody clearly gets hurt, I'm like, and dead. And uh, I think this one, maybe not dead, but Picard definitely would have broken a hip. But he was fine. He he walked it off. It's all good. It, it is a 23rd, 24th. I keep flipping back and forth between the two. 24th. 24th century. Uh, bones are stronger. But they had a nice little connect, a nice little conversation on his patio while he's looking up at the sky. Uh, basically, say where Picard says that he tried very, very hard to belong at the chateau to make it his home, but he felt as though he never really succeeded at that. And she said something to the effect of, "Well, I could tell that you were always looking at the stars." So that was. A nice little defining moment in their relationship. Um, I'm really hoping that even though he's not on Earth anymore, that uh, Lyris and what is it Zaban? Yep, Zaban. Um, those are the two Romulans he lives with. Also, he's not taking number one with him, which makes me very sad. Number one, the dog, not number one, Will Riker. Correct. Makes me sad because the dog's not going to understand. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yep, exactly. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. Anyway, so this episode was, a, as you can tell, it was a whole lot of exposition. And we're jumping around because there was points in exposition that evidently each of us thought were more important than others. And they weren't the same points. Which is fine. So, Apologies. Hopefully you've seen the episode so that all of us talking about the exposition of the show, <laughs> we're not spoiling it for you. So, yeah, apologies for that. But that's okay. Well, I think if you're listening to our review, you pretty much know spoilers. So That's very true. Um, I will say that uh, Soji's mom, I think, is actually a program that is uh, designed to interface with Soji and Daj's programming. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I mean, when she was talking to her mom, her quote-unquote mom on the hologram, she fell right asleep. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's the only reason I think that. And you don't really, I don't think we've actually seen her in person. Never seen her in person. It's only Of course, on granted, hologram. with the EMH and the E. NH, the, I mean, the program is pretty much perfect. Like, it's a person. Mm-hmm. That's correct. So. But we've never seen her in person. And the only other time that we've seen it, seen her, was when Dodge was confused and not knowing what to do. And her mother told her to go find Picard and she went. So, whether that was her just taking her mother's advice or something being triggered in her programming... I don't know, but based on the fact that she that that Soji basically fell into a dead sleep as if she was like being yeah, mickeyed. That's true. I I didn't even realize it when I was watching it, but I totally agree with you on that. That she could be some kind of plant, so to speak. Yeah, yeah the the number that they have for home mm-hmm. because Dodge and Soji both have memories of growing up and memories of their parents, which obviously are programmed into their neural net at least at this point so obviously their number for home could just very well be just something that triggers a hologram program yeah yeah so there's that then the last scene they start in this episode using motifs musical motifs in the score that harkens to the original scoring for the movies and for the next generation just the and even the original series the bum 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 they started Mm -hmm. doing that in the background when things started coming together and fitting together 
as the final pieces were, well, the final pieces for this episode anyway, were starting to fall into place. Uh, and I got to admit because of, I got to admit because of the connection that I have with TNG, with my, with my dad watching it all the time, I started getting a little like goosebumpy emotional as things were starting to fall into place with that. And yeah, the music uh, swells when they get ready to go into warp speed. And then I teared up. When he says the words. Yeah. Yeah, there's a moment where he's kind of standing by the pilot's chair, captain's chair, and the pilot kind of looks up at him, and Picard smiles and says, engage. And then the music swells, and boom, into warp speed. With, you're right, no other ship in orbit around Earth. When with no other ship in orbit around Earth. No wonder that in the Wrath of Khan, the Enterprise was the closest ship to Regula because... They're the only ship. They're the only ship in the the (laughs) galaxy. They're the flagship, but that's because they're the only ship. Right, exactly, exactly. So I just thought that was... (laughs) That always gets me as a kind of a Star Trek setting thing that whenever they go to a planet, whether it's a desolate world or the headquarters of the United Federation of Planets, they're the only ship in orbit. And I get why they do it. It's a it's a money thing for special effects and stuff. It just it also always, looks cleaner. It also yes, it also looks cleaner. It's just it's just one of those things that kind of not bugs me, but makes me kind of quirk my head a little bit. <laughs> but. All right. So in summary, uh, the end is the beginning is the episode that draws Captain Chris Rios, who is the pilot. And Picard does call him captain because it is Rios's ship. It's not Correct. Mm-hmm. it's not a Starfleet ship. It's he is the captain of that ship because he pilots that ship. Rafi Musinger, or Musiker, I, I, they never said her last name. Her first name was Rafi, and he, that's all he called her, is coming along because she wants to go to Free Cloud after Picard fed her a bunch of information to lead her to that end. Dr. Agnes Girati, who is the Earth's foremost expert on synthetic life, is coming along as well and guarantees that she will earn her keep. And so, and, and Picard, and they are going to find and rescue Soji, who does not know or is not in danger. I'm not sure which, because they've not made it incredibly clear, but she's definitely the focus of a spy operation by the super secret Romulan police. But their first mission, their first is to get part Maddox. of the rabbit hole is to go and try to find Bruce Maddox. Correct. Who I'm really hoping they get the original actor for that because even though he was kind of a prick in the episode, I thought he did a good job in Measure of a Man. Well, he had a he had a character arc in Measure of a Man. He he didn't come completely around, but he at least came to an understanding. True. true. He did grow a little bit from the court well, not the court martial, but the hearing. Um, the side, to the side, we have Commodore O, who is the head of security for Starfleet, who is chasing down Picard, trying to figure out what he knows and where he's going. And did you know that she's a bad guy? If I didn't already, the sunglasses would have given it away. Like, seriously, there is a scene with this woman, and she introduces herself, and all I could hear was, hello, I'm the bad guy. My name is Commander Commodore O, and I will be your bad guy this evening. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, that's what's killing me about this show. The bad guys. It's it, you just They're have like, do you do you hear yourself? <laughs> do you look at yourself in the mirror? Like seriously, how do people not think you're the bad guy? But but anyway, anyway, I <laughs> I apologize. I digress. Carry on. Narek is the Romulan who is on the board cube with Soji right now, and Soji is her is his target. Is his his mark, and he is sleeping with Soji, 
And he said that he thinks he's falling in love with her after sleeping with her once. So is he playing her or is he just a young boy in love? If he's a young boy in love, then has he never had sex before? I don't know. I haven't talked to him about his past yet. So. Oh, well, okay. All right. Um, Lieutenant Narissa Rizzo is his sister, who was embedded in Starfleet with cosmetically altering her ears so she would look like a human. Uh, his sister? He, she calls him brother, and I do genuinely believe that these two characters are creepy just for the sake of being creepy, because Game of Thrones was a thing that happened. Ah, okay. And was popular. So, and I, I say this as as kind of slamming on it a little bit, but it's not because I don't like the show. I think that... The mustache twirling creepy villains, all three of them are very odd to me. Because yeah, we had we had two dimensional villains throughout all of Star Trek. I mean TNG and not TNG, TOS had so so very many of those. But TOS also had Khan. TOS also had uh well, true, though, but this is also kind of a modern take on Star Trek. So them being so blatantly evil with everything else kind of flowing a different way, it just seems odd to me and kind of actually takes me out of the show when they come on screen. I want their plan to be actually revealed to be a lot more sophisticated than they seem to be. I think that will save that. Uh, because we don't genuinely know what's going on. It has something to do with maybe Romulan mythology, history, Yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely throwing a lot of different ideas out, especially this episode. So it's kind of like, what threads are they actually going to pick up on? If they make the bad guy's overall plan and plot more sophisticated than the villains themselves, I would be fine with how things play out. I just need them to actually be smarter than what they seem to be acting. Do you understand what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And if that happens, I'll be okay with them being mustache twirling evil, I guess, as long as everything turns out to be interesting. So far, it is. It's just those three characters... I don't know how Soji can't even see past his wig. I'm just saying, like, he is obviously, obviously a bad guy. And if he's not a bad guy, he's obviously a douche. So I don't, like, like a, the douche who brings the guitar to the party. I'm just, <sighs> I don't like Merrick is what I'm saying. All right. Okay, so, uh, all that being said, let's uh, wrap this up with our warp ratings. Of this specific so, episode? Of this specific episode. Okay. Um, so, as the Picard and his crew warped off at the end of this episode, Taking the whole episode, how fast do you think they were going? Warp 1 being the worst, the slowest, and Warp 1 being the test, or the best, and they just went with gangbusters this episode. Warp huh? 1 being the worst, and Warp 10 being the best? Yeah. You said Warp 1 twice. No, I'm sorry. Warp 1, the worst. Warp 10, the best. Okay. Warp 6. It was an enjoyable episode to watch, but it wasn't very exciting except for the one fight. And I was excited about seeing Hugh. I was excited about the the, the, the whole emotional ending to it. And it it didn't it didn't tick me off, but it was just above average this time. All right. Well, that for Ellen uh, looks like that navigator keeps going down. Uh, the first episode. Uh, had a very good warp rating. Second episode had a little bit less. And now this episode has a little bit less as well. Um, I'm going to give... I was going to give it 6.5. But I think I'll go down with you for that 6. It just seemed like... 
to me, they were throwing a lot of stuff at you with no real purpose to it. Kind of like, let's put all of all of the brainstorming notes we have for this whole series, let's just throw them out in an episode. And we'll let the audience try to figure out for themselves what's going on. And it didn't seem to me like there was a lot of kind of direction this episode. I also, once again, really, really don't like the mustache twirling villains. It's taken me out of the show every time they're on the screen. They didn't talk a lot about the double secret probationary sect of the Romulans this time. Except for the one they caught was a dumb northerner. Yeah, except for the one they caught. Um, so yeah, this one, there, and there wasn't, even with the fight, the fight was very well done. The special effects, once again, through this whole episode, amazingly done. I turned to Ellen and said, for all of the consoles and all of the computer special effects, obviously somebody was watching Iron Man <laughs> because that's the new Star Trek technology is Iron Man technology. But, um, but in my opinion, the special effects are amazing. But it just it didn't keep drawing me in. I was just kind of watching it. I was enjoying it, but there was just a lot of things that... It was certainly the... Not the meat of the chapter of a book, but it was the connecting chapter. This big event happens, connecting chapter, with lots of dialogue about what happened here, before, in this earlier chapter connecting chapter about dialogue about this before thing and what we're going to do in this future thing. That's right. where we're at right now. And I think maybe that's getting why we Getting everybody didn't. together, getting mm -hmm. them started. The end is the beginning, a very apt name for this episode. But for me, it was just a little bit more of a miss than the previous episodes we've seen. And weirdly enough, I kind of wanted to see some more aliens besides Romulans and humans, which is all we got in this episode. Oh, yeah, definitely. Right. Well, bored, but they all look like either Romulans or humans. At this point, yes. Right. I, they've not gone too much into other species that might be on the board, on the board cube at this point. But, yeah, they're humans. Which is really odd because Picard's new crew... It's all humans. Mm -hmm. So far, yeah. So, yeah, that actually... And that's it's, okay. It's interesting. It's okay. I just... Or even, like, different kinds of Romulans. More characterization with the Romulans. Because we only have gotten real characterization on two Romulans in the entire episode. Or in the entire series. Which is, yes, only three episodes. I do understand that. But we've only gotten character development on... Two of them, and there are five Romulan characters. Granted, three of them are bad guys, but there's... And we all know that they're not going to have personalities besides villains. Sunglass wearing, mustache yeah. twirling villains, bad right. wig having. So far, at least. So far, at least. But that's, I think that's where Steve and I both agree on, is this is not the meat of what this series is supposed to be. Or what we think this series is supposed to be. <laughs> Maybe it is going to be just a whole lot of talking. I don't know. But, I hope not. Um, I don't think so. But yes, The End is the Beginning is a really good name for this episode. Because once he said engage, that means the journey begins. Which is yes. where we need to be. Yes. The end of the previous, the end of the previous life of Picard. And the beginning of this new journey, this new chapter in his life. So, that being said, uh, once again, both Ellen and I have given this episode a rating of only a warp factor six. So, that's not horrible. We're out there cruising the galaxy, but we're definitely not on emergency mode yet. We don't need to get where we need to go yet. So, 
hopefully uh, we'll pick up that warp speed in the next coming episodes. But other than that, that's what we got for episode three of Star Trek Picard. The end is the beginning. Any, Ellen, any last little thoughts? Nothing at this uh, point. Uh, I'm, I'm said it all. All right. Well, looks like they are lighting the lanterns out on the streets of Royville. So until next time, everyone. Bye. Bye.